Hello, Math Humans. We're going to do 5.1 today. We're going to start talking about extreme values of functions. So our objectives are we're going to manage the absolute or global and then the local or relative extreme values. And then we're going to find those extreme values. So let's go back and talk about extreme values from a pre-calc standpoint. So if we had some random function and it had some stuff going on, we would have said that this is a relative maximum. We would have said that this is also a relative maximum. So it happened twice. And then we would say that this is a relative minimum. And then we would call this a relative minimum. Okay. Sometimes relative can also be called local, so those words are used interchangeably. Different books call them different things. All right. Um, it doesn't have a global or an absolute because this particular function continues forever down and forever up. On the other hand, if I had a parabola, this minimum value would be an absolute or global, depending again on the book that you're using, and this would be a minimum. Alrighty. So we have to make sure that we consider what's happening in a local area as opposed to what's happening for the whole function. All right, so we've talked about our vocabulary words. We've got absolute or global, local or relative. So now let's talk about a calculus theorem, and let's, it is called the extreme value theorem. Okay, it's going to have initials E, V, T. This is going to be something that you're going to want to add to your formula sheet. All right, so it says if F is continuous on a closed interval, and that closed interval typically is called A and B, it says then F has both a min and a max on that closed interval a to b. The extreme value theorem is also an existence theorem. And what that means, and we've talked about this before, is that in a particular closed interval, that means that that particular phenomenon exists. All right, if you're going to talk about an extreme value on a test or on an FRQ, sorry, my little Dealey is not cooperating, then you have to make sure that you talk about the conditions. You have to talk about the function being continuous. You have to talk about it being on a closed interval, and then you can talk about the mins and the maxes. All righty. So now let's talk about kind of a calculus perspective of extrema. So I'm going to have a function. It's going to look kind of like this. So this is some random function, and I'm going to have an interval from A to B. Well, I can find, I could find if I hadn't put it out of the function. There we go. Now I can get there. I can find F of A, and I could find F of B. So F of B would have a value that would be F of B. And then f of a, kind of pretend it's there, would be right there. So those would be my two values. I could calculate those, or I could be given values, and I could know that a on the closed interval is a local minimum. And then on b, I would know that it is a local maximum. Or you can use the words relative. I don't care. Either is appropriate and both are accepted. So now I want to talk about a couple other features about things that are going on in the graph. So if we look at this area right here, I notice that my function, my y values are increasing as I look at my x values going to the left. So I'm going to write x and I'm going to write y. And then as I get over here, this is where I have a horizontal tangent. Boy, that's a really unstraight line. And I notice that my slope is 0. That's a horizontal tangent. 
After the horizontal tangent, I notice that my y values are decreasing. So this is going to be de decreasing. This is increasing. I'm going to have another horizontal tangent where the slope is 0. And then my function is going to be increasing on this particular area. So when we talk about our graphs, oftentimes what we're looking for is we're looking for the slope to help show increasing. If the slope is increasing, it would be positive. So if the slope is greater than 0, then it's going to be increasing. If my slope is less than 0, then it's going to be a decreasing portion of the graph. And then when the slope is equal to 0, that's going to be where I have a horizontal tangent. I think you can still see it. I'll scoot it up just a little bit. That's going to be where I have a horizontal tangent. Also notice that that is where the function changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa from decreasing to increasing. So slopes change everywhere there is a horizontal tangent. Alrighty, the only other thing that about the extreme value theorem, and I'm going to write it, maybe I'll write it in red, that most people tend to forget is that I have to test, I have to test the endpoints. And any time we have a closed interval, I actually have to show that I tested that endpoint and I tested the other endpoint before I can talk about the extreme values of the function. Alrighty, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is actually finding extrema. Okay, so I'm going to write finding extrema. I think I have it scooted down far enough. Nope, I don't, so you can see it. Now I can. So it's really not a complicated process. The first thing that we're going to do is take a derivative and we're going to set it equal to 0. And so I'm going to just write that as an equation. Okay. All right, and oftentimes when you do an FRQ, if you show that you set the derivative equal to 0, you get a whole point. So showing and identifying our work is really important. From the derivative, or using the derivative, however you want to think about that, we're going to solve for x. And this is going to be what we're going to call a critical value. Because since we set the derivative equal to 0 and we solved, the critical values are going to be where the function changes. Those are going to be the places where I have my horizontal, my horizontal tangents. So I'm going to put that the critical values are the place where we will have a horizontal tangent which also means that's where increasing and decreasing change. So that's going to be that point of change in between those two things. Then the next thing that we want to do is we're going to evaluate a function. And by that I mean the original function, okay, not the derivative, at the endpoints. and at the critical values. All right, and I'm going to bring that graph that we had just done back for just a second. Notice that on the graph that we talked about, this is also going to be a relative maximum because that's also where I have a horizontal tangent and I was increasing and decreasing, so as I go up and come down, it creates a peak or a relative maximum. The opposite is true right here, and this is going to be a relative minimum. And notice that I have decreasing to increasing, and it actually kind of makes a little point and shows you what the graph is going to look like. We're going to use that feature in just a moment. All right, so now let's go ahead and tell you one more thing. So I'm going to say that a critical point can be where f prime of x is equal to 0. It could also be where the derivative does not exist. And remember that a derivative doesn't exist at a sharp point, a doink point, a cusp, 
all of those words however you want to say that. And then a stationary point, this book calls it a stationary point. I haven't focused on that in the past. But a stationary point is another word for our critical points. You're going to see it called both things in our Finney book. Alrighty, so let's do our first example. So for example number one, oop, my paper's not behaving. So for example number one, we're going to find the extrema, extrema just means there's more than one potentially, of f of x is equal to x to the two-thirds on the interval. And our interval is going to be from a negative 2 to 3. All right, so the first thing, directions are pretty short. The first thing that I want to do is I want to take my derivative. So I'm going to find my derivative. f prime of x is going to equal 2 thirds, sorry there's a 3, times x. 2 thirds minus 3 thirds, is, or 3 over 3, is going to be to the negative 1 third. So this is going to be 2 third over 3, and then the cube root of x, and we're going to set it equal to 0. Okay. Notice that the function is undefined at x is equal to 0 because we can't divide by 0. So since we can't find any values inside of the interval that equals 0, other than x is equal to 0, we're going to also test our endpoints. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the function at this value, and then I'm going to test it at the two endpoints. So I'm going to do f of a negative 2. This work actually has to be shown on your paper, no shortcuts. So if you're going to say that extrema exist on a closed interval, you have to show that you've taken or sorry, evaluated the function at the endpoints as well as at any critical feature. So then this is going to equal 1.587 because I pushed buttons on my calculator. Remember when you take the cube root it's important that you put this in parentheses, otherwise you're going to get an incorrect answer. f of 0 is going to be 0, and it's undefined when x is equal to 0. Okay, so it actually doesn't equal 0, it's undefined when x is equal to 0. And then f of 3 is going to be 3 to the 2 thirds, and that's going to be 2.080. So just from the numerically, I know that I probably have, this is going to be a relative minimum, this is going to be, potentially, this is a maximum, but I'm thinking that something important goes here. So if you were to actually put this in your calculator and check, the graph looks something like that. Well, and this becomes the absolute minimum of the graph. And so I'm going to say that f of x has an absolute min at x is equal to 0. The reason that we couldn't evaluate it is because it's undefined, because it's a sharp point, which means that I can't take the derivative. And then this was my maximum value. So I'm going to say that f of x has an absolute, oops, sorry, bad grammar, has an absolute max at x is equal to 2.080, and then that completes our information for example number one. All right, let's move on and do another example. Example number two, same thing. So for example number two, yes, I could do this with pre-calc. That's not the point. The point is you have to show the work that we are finding extrema using calculus. So I'm going to find the extreme values. All right, so the expectation is that you always use calculus. Well, duh, because we're in calculus. Here's my function. It's going to be 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared. And just for the sake of taking the derivative, I'm going to write this as 4 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. 
So now I notice from a, the original function that I have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to plus or minus 2. And I found that by setting this equal to 0 and solve for x, and those are my two vertical asymptotes. So now if I take my derivative, it's going to be a negative 1 half times 4 minus x squared to the negative 3 halves times the derivative of the inside, a negative 2x. These x's cancel, and so this is going to turn out to be, and I have a negative and a negative, it's a positive, so here's my positive x, and then in the denominator, oops, I'm going to use parentheses, I'm going to have 4 minus x squared to the 3 halves, and I'm going to set it equal to 0. To solve this equation, I would cross multiply, and this is going to equal 0. So the problem child is going to go away. My critical value is going to happen right here at x is equal to 0. Alrighty. So I also know that I have vertical asymptotes, and that's going to push my graph. But now what I would do is I would test my function. So because this one didn't give me a closed interval, I would test just my one critical value. So if I test f of 0, I'm going to get 1 over 4 minus 0, and so I'm going to get 1 over 2. This is an interesting situation where you would actually kind of want to do the graph because we had vertical asymptotes on this one. So here are my vertical asymptotes, and here's the 2. And then I get that when x is equal to 0, the function is a half, and it actually looks kind of like that. So there's the 1 half. So the 1 half is going to be the absolute minimum. So sometimes we have to use a, a combination of calculus and our calculators. Because we could find no other values, I could do some interesting work, but I would probably need to rely on my calculator. All right, so now let's do example number three. This one is going to have a closed interval. So example number three says find the extrema on the interval. And I'm going to have from a negative 1 to 2, and my function is going to be 3x to the 4th minus 4x to the 3rd. Because it's a closed interval, remember by the extreme value theorem, I need to check the endpoints, so we will do that. The first thing that we're going to do is take the derivative, and then we're going to find our critical points. So I'm going to take the derivative, and I'm going to get 12x to the 3rd minus 12x squared. I'm going to set it equal to 0. Remember, this is a really important step, especially if you're doing an FRQ. I'm going to factor out a 12x squared, and I'm going to get x minus 1 is equal to 0. From my two baby equations, I get x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 1. So I know that I have critical values at x is equal to 0 and 1, and then I'm going to test my endpoints of a negative 1 and 2. So now we're just going to do that evaluation. So I'm going to evaluate f of a negative 1, and I would substitute all of these back into the original function, right? And so when I do that, f of a negative 1 is going to be 7. And I'm not going to do all of the work because I'm assuming at this point that you're brilliant and we don't need to do that. f of 0 is 0. And then I'm going to have f of, sorry, my thingy seems to not be focused. Hold on. Whoop, there we go. That's better. If I do f of 1, I'm going to get a negative 1, and if I do f of 2, I'm going to get 16. Well, f of 2 is obviously going to be a maximum, and then my, my smallest value is f of 1. So this is going to be my min. So because, sorry, brain and mouth aren't working at the same speed, if we were doing an FRQ, you have to show this work. Otherwise, you get no credit because they assume that you just push buttons on your calculator. So we would say that the function has a minimum at x is equal to 1, or you could say has a minimum of a negative 1 when 
x equals 1. And then I'm going to say f has a maximum at x is equal to 2. Same thing. Or you could say has a maximum of 16 when x is equal to 2. So it doesn't matter which way you report. You just have to be careful and make sure you answer the questions that are asked. All right, we have one more example. And this one involves some trig. Yeah, trig. It's my favorite. So example number four. All right, we want to find the extremum of f of x is equal to 2 sine x minus the cosine of 2x. This is a double angle. And we want to do it on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Alrighty, so I'm going to rewrite my function f of x is equal to, this is 2 sine x minus the cosine of 2x. I'm going to take my derivative. So my derivative is going to be 2 cosine x minus, this is the chain rule, the derivative of cosine is the sine of 2x times the derivative of the inside, which is 2, and I'm going to set it equal to 0. This is just a really good habit to be in when you're finding extrema or you're working with situations like this. So now what I'm going to do is this is 2 cosine x, and then this is minus 2 sine of 2x, okay? All right, because this is a double angle, and we've talked about memorizing this, I'm going to actually factor out the 2 first because it's going to make my math life a little bit easier. So here's minus the sine of 2x. This is, excuse me, a double angle. So I'm going to do, here's the original cosine, and then this is going to be, except I think I have a sign mistake, I do, plus, 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 and plus, then this is going to be, the sine of 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. And again, this is the identity. It's the sine of a double angle. So now I'm going to factor out a cosine. So I'm going to have 2 cosine x times 1 plus 2 sine x. It's still equal to 0. So now I have two baby equations. I have this one and this one. So if I set 2 cosine x equal to 0, I get the cosine of x is 0. Cosine is 0 here and here. So this is pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And then this one is going to say 2 sine of x is a negative 1. Sine of x is a negative 1 half. Sine is negative in the third and fourth quadrants. So if this is a negative 1 and 2, that means this is the radical 3. Opposite of 1 is a pi over 6. So this is 6 pi over 6 plus 1. This is 7 pi over 6. All the way around would be 12 pi over 6. Back up a pi over 6. So this is 11 pi over 6. So my critical values are going to be x is equal to pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and then I have, and I'm looking, where did those two come from? Oh, because I have to test the endpoints. Silly me. 7 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6, and then I have my two endpoints that you can't see. I scoot it down a little bit. 0 and 2 pi. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of values. Alrighty. So I'm not going to show all of the arithmetic because at this point I'm going to assume that you're brilliant. So I'm going to show the work though. So I'm going to do f of 0 and I'm going to write that it's 1. f of pi over 2 and notice my notation which means I'm substituting these values back into the original function and I'm going to get that this is 3 and then I'm going to do f of 3 pi over 2 and I'm going to get a negative 1 f of 7 pi over 6, and I would label this guy and this guy negative 1, 2 to make the process easier. 7 pi over 6 is going to be a negative 3 halves, and then my last one is f of 11 pi over 6 is a negative 3 halves. Just in the interest of time, I'm not showing that work, 
but if I were doing this problem by hand, I would indeed show all of that work. So we'll notice that, um, where is my maximum? This one is going to be my maximum, and I have a minimum here and here. So this is a max, and this is a min. So I'm going to say F has a maximum at x is equal to pi over 2, and f has a minimum at x is equal to 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. And then again, depending on what the problem is asking for, then I would either have to find the y value or I was just happy with x. All right, my dears, that is it for today. I will see you soon.